to welcome back friends to the shop. Today we're gonna attempt to do something that I've never done before and that's to turn an oval handle on a lathe. So this is a project that I've really been looking forward to doing. These two hammers belong to my grandfather. He was a mechanic and these were in his toolbox. These were hammers that I used uh, when I was just a little kid working in, my, working in his shop with him, uh, doing transmissions and different things. What's kind of interesting about these is, as far as I can tell, the hammers are almost identical. They're probably from the same manufacturer. But what is really typical with mechanics uh, or guys that work in confined areas is that to have tools with short handles on them. You'll notice that uh, any heavy equipment mechanic, or many of them, the old school guys would take and they would actually cut the handles off or make their own to make them a little bit uh, smaller. That, therefore, they work better in confined areas. And I, I don't know for certain, for certain, but if I had to guess from looking at it, I'll bet that this is a mass produced handle. This would have been probably one that you would have bought or maybe a replacement handle. It could be it could be the original, although I doubt it. This one here, I'm pretty convinced that uh, Granddad probably made this one himself. You can see he's taken about an inch and a half off of it and it just doesn't have it just doesn't have that look in line. It has that look of a homemade handle. You know, you don't have that nice, beautiful sweeping palm swell right there that goes into a taper. It's just, it's, there's nothing wrong with it. It's just, um, th that's, that's something that was probably built for utility. You know, a guy that needed a handle and needed it quick, needed to make his, you know, to, to, to use it to make his living, and that's what you get. So we need to decide on which one of these that we want to replace, because both of them are loose. I know folks will say, well, you know, your granddad made that, you should probably keep it. Well, I disagree with that. I, I, I'm not about collecting tools to keep. Um, I like to have them, I like to use them, and it gives me a lot more pleasure to grab it out of the toolbox and know that, that I have a family tool uh, that's still uh, usable. So what I think I'll do is I'll choose the one that has the best, in, best condition, on the striking face, and that's the little guy right here. Before we select the wood, let's cut the, the old handle off and uh, do a quick resto on the, on the head and see what we got. Make sure we don't have any cracks or anything that's hidden behind the rust. When I set up my shop, something that's been uh, so helpful is to have, um, is to set it up kind of like a, a galley kitchen. You know what a galley kitchen is? A galley kitchen's considered to be uh, the most efficient use of space. That's why that's what you see typically with uh, restaurants, high production, you'll see it. I think even on a submarine one time, they kind of set it up that way. And it's what it is, is it's uh, two, basically two, uh, two bars. So you have your workbench here, and then you have your most used tools right behind you. So when you're working and you need something, it's very efficient to simply turn around and to grab the saw or the chisel or the plane that you need and right back to the workbench. That's kind of the galley concept. Now we need to punch the handle out of the eye. One thing that you want to do uh, when, you, when you're doing a project like this is make sure you mark uh, the top uh, of the handle. There, there are subtle differences on the taper uh, for if the way that they're made um, and if you put them on backwards you'll have a hard time of keeping it tight. So you can use a silver sharpie or take a file and just make a little cross and it's just something that's a reference point. Now on the smaller handles like this I can typically just use the holes and the dog holes in my bench and just punch that through. If you find something larger like an axe handle or stuff you can just prop that up on a couple of pieces of hardwood. Uh, for the axes, I use these this big drift, and then for the smaller ones like this, I'll just use a, a heavy punch. But you can should be able to knock that. If there are any wedges in there, you want to remove those, but I don't believe there's one in this one. A great way to clean up these vintage tool heads, hammers especially, uh, is just your bench grinder. And you want when you set up your bench grinders, you want to put a, a stone on one side, a grinding stone, and then a wire brush on the other. A lot of them come this way. It just makes it much more versatile.
with just a little bit of work on that wire wheel, you can really uh, clean these beautiful old vintage tools up. I, I've always had an affection for ball peen hammers, just the design of it. And this, look at the taper in it. You just don't see that with the, the newer ones. It's so just beautifully balanced, beautifully made. Just, uh, just the coolest thing. All right, so we kept our marks right there. Uh, so now we've got to, this is where we got to really inspect the hammer. If you're going to go to the lot, a lot of trouble of making a handmade handle, you don't want to make it for something that's um, damaged or cracked. And this is, overall, this is in really good shape. We can see that the face uh, doesn't have a lot of chipping. When you're looking for these at garage sales or antique stores, you should be able to buy them for anywhere from 50 cents to $2 or so. If they have a lot of chipping or heavy chipping on the edges of the face there, you might want to continue looking, unless it is a family tool that you want to keep. Um, that's a different thing. Now on the on the back side, on the ball side, we can see that we've got a lot of scratching and some rough areas there uh, from pounding against something that was sharp. Let's let's dress that. Let's clean that up. We don't want that because if we you want to be able to use a ball peen hammer to to work with sheet metal and, and to round things. And if you have a a striking face that's all chewed up like that, it's going to reflect transfer into your work. So we can put this on the vise and I think we can clean this up uh, really nicely. Little projects like this are the are the exact reason why I, I uh, you know, built, to, um, have a machinist vise in here. I mean, you can hold these things with the wood vise, but not recommended. You won't want to use a lot of metal and where you're doing filing and stuff, it gets in and messes, if, messes up. When we're working with these heirloom tools, we want to be careful um, and to not, not beat them up. And you have to, a lot of times these machinist vise will have, uh, uh, corrugated or really heavy textured replaceable jaws on them and and the steel on these is very hard and if you if you clamp these up they will mar the surface no matter I don't care how careful you are so you have a couple options what you want to use is a is a um, jaws kind of these inserts you can use aluminum uh, you can use brass any one of these is going to be softer uh, than the, the tool metal what I typically end up using more than any of those uh, are these silica, or I, they're just some sort of a rubber, um, and these work really well. And what it does is, is that you can get it in there and you can bite your tool uh, very tight. It, it, they have a little bit of flex in them, but it, they're so sticky that they don't seem to slip out near as much, and it gives you um, the ability to get a lot nicer job um, on your filing. So we'll clamp that in there nice and tight. A good all-around file to use is a, uh, of course, a mill bastard file. This is a really special one. This is a Nicholson. This is a vintage file that that um, a mill bastard file here that is brand new, an eight inch. And where the old ones are, so they're just so much better. This is a file card. Uh, you want to have a clean, a clean uh, filing surface. The the steel in the file will actually pick up and store material, and it uh, will dull the file quicker and it will uh, not be as effective. So have this close by, have, always have these together, and then uh, periodically clean the, clean the file. The process that you use to resurface the round portion of your ball peen um, is uh, always keep your file moving. You don't want to go file across because you'll file flat spots. So what that means is as we're filing, we're moving up and we're rolling at the same time. So it's a, it's a motion just like this and you're working your body around and you're basically connecting, just figure a, a line around there like a hat brim sitting around there and you're connecting up to that point there and you're taking out those cuts and those imperfections. Now if you have things that are super deep, you'll have to make a decision uh, to uh, continue just to leave them or to continue taking the, the head down. This one here is not too bad so I think we'll, and I'm moving my body as they need be, keeping everything symmetrical. Flip your file over when it starts to load up a little bit. Once you removed all the damaged areas there, I'll just kind of do a once over, over the top. And kind of rebuild, come at two angles, rebuild that that round surface. In a little bit of practice, you can, you can get it. We can see we've got all of the imperfections out of there. We've got a nice, nice even dome there. Now there's gonna be quite a few tool marks in there. 
Uh, to get rid of those, you can, what seems to work best is about 150 grit sandpaper or emery paper, even better. Um, and you can kind of, don't put it on a block. You want it to be able to kind of bend and form around the dome and just go around in kind of a circular pattern. And in five minutes or so, that, that will remove those tool marks and kind of knock down the high spots and give you a really nice, consistently even dome on the hammer that looks uh, will look original. When you're done with the sanding, just take that back over to your wire brush on your grinder, and you can see that uh, looks a lot better right there. It's nice and smooth and and round and very consistent. Much, much better. Now, on the strike face, uh, this has to be done right. You have to be really careful with these. You have to remember not to grind them flat. The strike face needs to have a bit of a, of a convex in it um, and a little chamfer around the outside. This is actually really good, and I'm, you know, the more I look at it here, I'm not going to fool with it. If you wanted to, to change that, of course, the process is just the same. You file across and rotate around and then put a little chamfer around there, a little bevel. That will prevent it. Well, it'd be less likely to chip. If you miss strike and you hit the corner, it's going to be a much stronger edge. So it wouldn't be a bad idea to, you can improve upon that by just going around and putting that chamfer on there, cleaning it up. That's quite a transformation there. This is a great project for you. This is, if you want to do it, uh, get into tool restoration, you want to start building up, you know, your collection of quality vintage tools, this is a good place to start. A ball peen hammer, you want a small one, you want a large one. You know, maybe a 16 ounce and a, you know, a big masher, a 32 or so, is pretty nice or heavier uh, for heavy work. But this is, it's just a staple around the shop. To have a small piece of railroad tie, or a small anvil, or just using the back of your vise um, for pressing little things. Uh, it's just, it's, a, it's indispensable. It's an incredible tool, but look at the difference. I mean, these two were pretty comparable when we started, right? And uh, looks a lot nicer. Well, of course, we'll need to do both of them, but uh, this one for now. So next video, we'll, we'll do the handle. We'll select grade a very special piece of hickory. There's nothing better for tool handle than American hickory. Um, and then we'll uh, we'll build a very we'll build a special handle for this as well. So I think it's time for manly manners. Let's work see if we can work a manly manners in. So before we start manly manners, I have to publish a retraction. Yesterday I made a comment that Jordan in the P Jordan Peterson video, Jordan Peter was an atheist. Um, that was an assumption on my part that may very well be wrong. So if I'm wrong on that, I do uh, I certainly do apologize. I have nothing but um, the greatest respect for Jordan. Um, I think he's doing a, a lot of good. Um, I, I thought to myself, where did I get that? Had I heard that or had I heard him say this before? And I have watched many, many hours of him on podcasts and different interviews. And I, can't, I guess the reason why I came away with that impression is I never saw him mix the two. And then people, you know, will, will foolishly say, well, you, you know, that, that just alienates people. You can't, you know, church and state and all that nonsense. Well, I disagree with that. I think that you know, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And if you are going to express mis wisdom that's going to express pe or it's going to affect people's lives, um, that comes from that comes from the Creator. And so to to claim that, and I'm not saying he's doing that, but if, to claim that as yourself and to never ever mention or or I, to to bring that up into the conversation. Well, you know, maybe people look at it differently. Some people, I, I understand that they'll say, well, you know, if you're talking about people that are not, that don't have the belief or faith, they're automatically going to stop listening to if you bring this in. That, very, that I don't know. I mean, that's a different call. We all have our different ways of doing it. But it seems to me uh, that if you are a Christian, it, everyone should know. There should be no question about it. Unless you're afraid, unless you don't have the courage to express that or you fear that, if by saying as much or admitting as much that it might affect you, your popularity or affect you financially, then that is a whole nother thing. So if he is or if he isn't, um, I just don't know. But uh, I, would, I, I would be surprised uh, who someone who is a Christian after watching them inter be interviewed, you know, 50, 60, 70 times that something wouldn't come out. So that's where I was coming from. So I'm not making excuses. I'm just saying that's just the way that I see it, but uh, that's certainly my opinion.
All right, Manly Manners. Manly Manners, if you're just joining us, is a little book published in 1913 called Don'ts for Husbands. Uh, and it gives us advice that we, uh, we are plodding through here to see if it uh, still applies to us today. So today's Manly Manners, don't belittle your wife before visitors. Oh, man. You may think it's a joke to speak of her little foibles, but she will not easily forgive you. Oh, that's a, you know, we've talked about this one before. That is really, that, that's one of the most destructive um, things that you can do in a relationship. And it's one of the most hurtful and the thing I see it, I see it happen all the time. Perfect example. You're going out to dinner with a couple um, and some topic comes up and the husband, uh, he's got inside information on his wife. Of course, he, who knows her better than that? Who knows all of her, her fine points or maybe her points that are not so fine. And to air that in public, with the, with the intention of uh, the, the, what's so insidious about it is that it's easy to do because you can pass it off as, oh, I was just joking. Well, it doesn't change the fact that you just destroyed this person. You have violated the, your trust in the marriage, in the relationship, and you have humiliated the one that you should be protecting, the one that you should love more than, more than uh, your, your own life, life itself. Um, you've humiliated her um, in front of a group of people. There, there is, on the, on the scale of, of worst things you could do to your wife, that I'll tell you um, is up in the top two or three. Um, and it's, you be careful with that. We're all guilty of it. I'm, I'm not preaching or, or judging you. I'm talking, to, this, is, this is for us to benefit. I have caught myself almost doing this before, and we have been very careful and been very deliberate about it. We have never, ever... Um, taken grievances or complaints in our marriage outside of the marriage, we've always kept them inside. And I trust Mrs. W. absolutely. She trusts me absolutely. When I go out and if someone asks me a question about our relationship, I don't care if it's an intimate friend or it's a, an acquaintance or someone that I just met, I am her biggest advocate. I am her biggest cheerleader and she does the same for me. And um, it doesn't mean that we have the perfect relationship. It doesn't mean that we agree on everything. But we show one another respect and we do that. It's very, very important. Remember that. If you don't do anything else today, um, be a cheerleader for your wife. Be a cheerleader for your husband. And if you have issues, take it to them and keep it in the house. Don't, don't break that trust and don't break her heart. All right. Thanks for watching and we'll see you guys on the next video.